I'm Brody Vincent, and thanks for tuning into this episode of Profession Session. My guest today is Ariel Morel. He comes from the banking world, and now he helps entrepreneurs access funding and grants to help grow their business. And the biggest misconception is that people don't, don't want to apply because they don't want to put in the work. And like, honestly, if I was starting all over brand new, I would just focus on getting as many grants as possible. This was an absolute masterclass on not only how to get free money that doesn't cost you anything, who doesn't want that, and how to save on taxes and use the best tax strategy for your business. Tune into this one to just hear all kinds of resources that are available locally, nationally, on the internet, and otherwise. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. The most successful entrepreneurs are way more successful than me. They came from nothing. They had like nothing else to provide, and they just said like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna become successful, whatever it takes. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Profession Session. My goal with this podcast is to expose you to incredible entrepreneurs so that you can hear more about the mindset behind their success, as well as some of the tactics that have allowed them to achieve the success. If you've ever gotten value from this, or if you get value from this episode, I encourage you to like, subscribe, and especially to share this podcast with as many people as you can so that it can help other aspiring entrepreneurs to have the kinds of success that these ones have had. Thank you so much and enjoy this episode. So uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. And I'm also a former bank vice president. So I own a business consulting firm that focuses on helping entrepreneurs legally lower the tax liability and get access to uh, commercial loans. And that's pretty much what I do. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been doing this now? Uh, probably since like 2015. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So you came from the banking world. Tell me a little bit about getting into that initially and the, the process of building that experience that has led to the consulting? <clears throat> so the way that I started, uh, when I was uh, 18, uh, I, wanted to, I had an ATM company. I needed more capital so I could get uh, more funds to get more ATM companies, right? ATM machines, right? So I go to the bank, get the client, and I was like, oh, great. Then my father had great credit. I go to the bank with him. Uh, he wanted to buy a building and also help me out. He also gets the client. They're like, wait, we both have good credit. What's going on here? So eventually I said like, uh, we, we, we gotta go and join the enemy, right? <laughs> so I decided like I had to start working for the banking industry and started all the way as a teller. Um, but my, my main purpose was to learn exactly how the bank lands, like what are the guidelines? So I joined, climbed through the ranks from teller to a branch manager, all the way to a, a, like senior vice president uh, in the commercial lending department. Like I used to be a business banking relationship manager and I used to have a territory. Uh, but what I did was when I joined the bank, uh, I had to figure out like, who is the decision maker that decides that you're going to get approved or not for a loan. That is the underwriter. So the underwriters have something called the internal lending guidelines. That document literally says exactly what the bank utilizes to decide if you're going to be approved or not. So I was able to get access to that document, and I was able to know before I would even submit a deal like what I needed to do to get them approved. And also so I could get approved to, so I could form my own business at the moment. And that's basically how I learned what I learned, and then... How did I learn about taxes? So when you are uh, at that level uh, doing, you know, multi-million dollar loans, uh, some, honestly, sometimes even less than a million, you have to uh, cash flow a deal. You have basically have to take all the financial documentation and see if the loan even makes sense before you even submit it to the underwriter. So <clears throat> something that I found out, I had like a company making $10 million a year and their net income would be like $20,000. It's like, what's going on here? And then you had somebody like what, making half a million dollars, like what a two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of net income, and they were paying more in taxes than the, than the big company. So, me as a lender, uh, there's something called a bid down, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, and those will be add backs to the cash uh, when you cash flow in the deal. So even though the company reported ten thousand dollars on their profit, the bank is willing to lend you as long as you can uh, add those things back, like the earn like the earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation, amortization. So. I had to get in contact with some of the best accountants in the country and they had to explain why that business was making $10,000. Hence, that's how I started learning about tax strategy. Because they literally tell me exactly what they did to help that client save a lot of money, paying less taxes than somebody making like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. And that's how I learned what I learned. And if you can figure out how to do both, you could really have your cake and eat it too. Exactly. It like you can, you can have a business doing a, really a ton of revenue while also saving on taxes and getting more funding for itself. And this is what all the big companies are doing that exactly. people don't really see behind the scenes. 
Yeah, and a lot of people complain about, oh, like, why am I paying more taxes than uh, than this corporation? But they, they're just playing into the game, mm -hmm. right? Like, the IRS literally tells you, like, we want to incentivize the economy, so they're going to incentivize first entrepreneurs. Why? Because entrepreneurs, uh, when you know, you create jobs, uh, you, you, you invest in real estate, so you create, like, affordable housing, uh, potentially, not on this market, <laughs> uh, for people. And then everything that you do is incentivizes the economy. So the government's like, let's give them some breaks, some tax breaks, so, like, some, so they can actually move forward and uh, incentivize the economy even more. Because me as a business owner, if I go and purchase a property, I could depreciate it and then like rent it to people. I, I just created like three to five different uh, rental units that people can live in. And unfortunately, when you're a W-2 employee, uh, you're actually, uh, you're not really contributing to the economy to make it better. You're just participating into it. So the government has limited things that you could do to help you uh, do some write-ups, right? And, but look, what I what I learned, like I'm not a I'm not a CPA, I'm not licensed. Uh, I just studied tax law because I hate overpaying on taxes, and I was able to learn it to those accountants. But anybody could do the same. You just gotta go to irs.gov. Like all the all the codes are there, and it's over 33. If you were to print everything on the irs.gov website for tax law, you you will, you can probably print over 33,000 pages. But Literally, like we could fill this whole room, right? But uh, all you have to do is you got to find what applies to you as an employee, business owner, and then uh, see if there's anything there that can help you, like save on taxes. And I've had calls with IRS agents before, just people to help me, help guide me towards the right documents. I think people don't quite realize how accessible mm -hmm. the agents are. You can just call them right up and they, there's usually not even really a wait. You can call them right up, they answer, and they'll guide you to exactly what document yeah. you need. And it depends on the department too, because uh, you know some of the wait times could be horrific. Sometimes you could be on the okay. phone for like three hours, depending on what you're what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have something specific and you get into the right department, you might not have to wait a long time. But uh, they're there to help you. If anything, they're they're happy to uh, talk to somebody because you know everybody hates the IRS guy, right? But realistically, most of them are there to help you and make sure making sure that you're following the law. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. People hate their rules, but if you just understand their rules and agree to play by them, you can win. Yeah, you you could hate the game, or you could be a part of it. So commercial lending, I want to talk about that and some of the common misconceptions about it. What, why do you think people don't understand how lending works and what do people usually get wrong? So um, how many banks can you name from the top of your head? Chase, Bank of America, PNC, uh, BBVA, they got bought by PNC, um, Wells Fargo. Not a, not that many, honestly. So less than ones. less than ten. You know how many banks are in the United States? A lot. Four thousand one hundred forty-four uh, that are FDIC insured, and thousands of financial uh, fintech institutions. So most people know about ten. They have their strict guidelines. They have taken over the market share because they spend millions of dollars. You see them on the Super Bowl to make sure that people know them. Mm -hmm. The other forty-eight hundred banks, like 40, for the other forty-eight hundred uh, thirty-four, because you mentioned are around ten. Uh, they're waiting for customers just like you or uh, to walk through the doors because they don't have the same market share. And every bank, sometimes they have different policies that are not as, as strict as the big banks have. So you need to learn how to navigate through the whole system and locate the bank that's appropriate for you. Interesting. If you are a business owner that's trying to locate the right bank for you, where do you start? So what I will do is the first thing. Uh, there's something called backyard banking. So... That's where uh, you're able to find those 4,800 banks. You, the first thing, you could literally, you probably drive by these banks every single day. You see them on a small little corner. I don't know if you've seen some of the banks uh, here downtown. Uh, it, it looks like a mini office. It doesn't even really look like a bank. They might have like less than five branches. But here's the key. You can walk into those branches that they serve the community they're in. They want to make sure they're helping the economy in that specific community. And this is what, like the biggest difference between the big banks and them. You can walk in, and then now you're talking uh, to the person that might be able to make, make the decision on your loan. Because sometimes you might be talking to like the, the BP of business banking for the whole bank, right? Mm -hmm. For the small bank. And you build that relationship and they're gonna leverage relationship banking the way that it used to be before. The big banks, all they have is an algorithm. That you don't meet that that, uh, that criteria, you get a decline. Nobody even takes a look at that. You can't get anywhere near a decision maker. Exactly, not, not at all. Even when I was working at the bank, like I, I, I could talk to the underwriters, but it, those interactions were like limited. Mm -hmm. At, at the local banks, you're talking to the person who's gonna, you know, be, uh, approve that loan or not for you. So it's as simple as just going in, building a relationship. Like, hey, I'm a business owner, uh, I'm looking to invest into real estate in this specific area. I'm tired of the big banks. I want to work with a local community bank. What programs do you guys have for me? 
And sometimes they have like uh, you know programs like to fix distressed properties. And I'm just talking about real estate, right? Like there's a whole bunch of other things that they they offer that maybe they want to incentivize people investing in that area for people that actually live there. And they have, they have programs sometimes that the credit scores have to be all that. Maybe you don't have to put like 20 to 25 percent down payment, but they're not gonna really promote those programs because if they did, everybody's gonna start flocking over there. But you build that relationship with that key person, the relationship manager, the VP of the business banking. And you know, like a trial network with them, they're gonna think about you whenever they have that program that they only send to their the people that they know. So if you're a young entrepreneur and you don't re- you just know that you want to be a business owner, you don't really know what you want to do yet. This sounds like the key. It sounds like go find and create a relationship with one of these bankers, get as close to the decision maker as you can and just figure out one of these programs and you can essentially build a business off of one of these programs. Yeah, some of them even uh, offer startup funding uh, as long as it makes sense, as long as you're able to repay the loan. Uh, and some of them that have specific programs you to help out in the community and the, the credit box is way smaller. I mean, so way bigger compared to the big banks. Now, what are some of the things that you think are the, the common guidelines across all banks that people need to, at a minimum, be considering if they're looking for funding? So I'm going to tell you exactly how the uh, underwriters work, uh, think when whenever they, they get a loan. And most banks follow the, uh, the same guidelines. So it's called the five C's of credit. So whenever a loan comes into the bank, they're going to measure five things. Capacity. Do you have the ability to repay the loan? So you have a business making $100,000 a year, and you're asking for $10 million, like you're going to get declined because you're not able to pay that back. Uh, they're looking at your character. So character will be, uh, what is your credit score? Like how responsible have you been as a person? Uh, you know, that's measured by your personal credit score by paying your obligations back, right? They're looking at the condition of the industry. So for example, you go to the bank right now, like, hey, I want to open the next Blockbuster. They're gonna be like, oh, that industry failed. Look at what happened to Blockbuster. It's not, it's not really thriving. So, like, what type of industry you're in? Uh, also, they're looking at uh, uh, collateral. What can a bank take if you're not able to pay that back? So, it could feel more secure. The mm-hmm. more that you can provide, the better. And lastly, you're looking at um, capital. Banks love when you have skin in the game. So, for example, that's when you buy a house. They want you to put a down payment. Some uh, auto lenders want you to put a down payment, but not all the time you know how to negotiate. Because when you put half skin in the game, you're less likely to uh, default on that loan because, like, wait a minute, I, used, I had to spend $40,000 to buy this house. So I don't want to lose the $40,000, but you're not thinking that the bank's about to take a, a $400,000 loss. That's just a human's thing. So as long as you can figure out what uh, the requirements for the five C's of credit for the thing that you're applying at the bank, you can ask the business banker. Like by following those five C's, then you're gonna be have a better time and a better likelihood of getting approved before you even apply, because you know you're gonna meet the requirements on that. Now, what are some of the industries that you think are are really ones that you should be avoiding right now, and what are some that you have seen do really well that? Just from a banking standpoint, a banking lending standpoint, what are they saying no to most of the time? What are they saying yes to most of the time? So this probably applies more for the, to the big banks. So banks have something called like the uh, auto decline list or the high risk industries. So a high risk industry is basically any industry that has a uh, low barrier to entry. Anybody could do it. So for example, real estate uh, with the big banks, they hate like new real estate investors. And I say, hey, because uh, mo- when you get into real estate, uh, you make a mistake with your profit margins, you could be taking a, a, a net loss. Mm-hmm. And you could be out of business before you even start because it takes a lot of experience of so you knowing how to manage general contractors, finding like a good property to, to see if, uh, you, you'll be, you, if you're even going to be able to have equity. So, they, hate, you know, but that's big banks. All the, interest, all the other smaller banks might be willing to take a look at it. So they hate that. Uh, they hate like money services businesses, credit repair, um, kind of the cannabis industry. I'm going to tell you exactly why because Anything that one piece of legislation that can change, like that could change that industry overnight, that could put you out of business, they don't want to take a look at it. Yeah. So with the cannabis industry, like it's legal in some, some states, but then uh, you know whoever takes over a new president, they could say like, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm I'm federally banning that all over the country. They're out of business right away. So super risky. So uh, that's 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 kind of like the the idea with it. Uh, and what do big banks love? There's something called uh, goodwill lending. So banks love uh, when you are part of an industry that has a high barrier to entry, right? Meaning that you have you weren't gonna be a doctor, you have to go to medical school, twelve to sixteen years. So not everybody is gonna become a doctor, and most doctors are known to like you know make a nice amount of money depending on what uh, what they're doing. So some banks are even willing to give uh, give loans, like depending on if you're in a Google industry, 
uh, regardless of your credit, <laughs> regardless of, um, you know, you meet the, the FICES of credit, they're willing to make exceptions. They have specialty programs like to, for Goodwill lending. And that's just one example, you know, like the law, uh, lawyers. Uh, so surprisingly, banks love dentists. Like they're super profitable for them, right? So everyone needs one. Yeah, exactly. So you're never gonna run out of business. So you know, like those type of industries, like big the big banks are more favorable uh, towards to. Very cool. So if you have gone through a large amount of school, it's actually very much to your benefit to go the entrepreneurial route and just make your own practice because the banks are gonna be favorable. Yeah, and an industry that's recession proof. It doesn't matter the state of the economy, people get sick, people are gonna get sick. If you get sued, regardless of whatever state of the economy, you're gonna need a lawyer. And just like you said, like you, you're always gonna need a dentist at least like twice a year. Yeah, I'm in the world of exit planning and it reminds me of what a lot of buyers of businesses are looking for right now. It's they're looking for when you ask a broker or an M&A advisor, what types of businesses are your buyers looking for? A lot of times it's just the most boring things you could possibly think mm -hmm. of. Plumbing, flooring, yep. roofing, yep. all those types of things. HVAC is huge right now too. HVAC because yeah. they just, they want something that is recession proof and it is proven customers are going to come in no matter what it's mm -hmm. it's not some cutting edge new thing yep. that is it's boring and old but like all uh, the beautiful thing about those type of businesses especially with uh all the baby boomers retiring those businesses some, some of them don't even have a website and they're like multi-million dollar businesses so you add a little bit of like marketing to it you could like 2x like the business right away so yeah. you know for those of you that are thinking about buying a business, since that's the field that you're in that that that's those are some good industries to think about, about getting into wow and Pairing that knowledge with the knowledge of the funding, you could really just go get an incredible amount of money with a good credit score and just throw it into some good marketing and advertising for a boring business and well, explode it. That, or you could leverage uh, the SBA, the Small Business Administration, all right? Like, so- Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so the SBA, uh, the whole purpose is like, they want to incentivize the economy. So they fund a lot of programs, sometimes directly, or they guarantee loans with the big banks. So sometimes when you get an SBA loan, it might be Wells Fargo lending to you, right? One of the big banks, but then the the SBA is saying like we're gonna guarantee eighty to like seventy to ninety percent of that loan. So the bank's like, sure, we'll do the loan. So we're just a little bit riskier, and we have the government backing us up, right? So that's because the if it does fail, it just costs them. 10% of what yeah. it would otherwise. So they lower the uh, the requirements. Exactly, they lower the requirements. And then uh, on top of that, a lot of people don't know this, but the SBA is willing to fund uh, startup acqu like acquisitions, right? Like uh, I remember helping somebody one time get access to a loan uh, to, uh, to purchase a McDonald's franchise. And while they're like main requirements, besides I'm not gonna really gonna get into details, but that person had over 20 years of experience in that industry, right? That's the, that's the key thing. You have to mm -hmm. actually have experience in the industry. Yeah. Roll like a nice business plan, had the ability to repay part of the loan, and she was able to get approved and get her uh, own a franchise, right? And she never thought that, that would even be possible. That's a key thing. You have to have experience in the industry, have a really good business plan, like a realistic business plan with financial projections, and SBA is willing to uh, uh, lend you, depending on the bank that you find. How do they typically look at and rate experience in the industry? Is it mostly just years under the gun or is it a number of different factors that they're looking at? So it's, it's definitely years, right? Uh, years and also they're taking a look at the industry. That, again, like if the condition of the industry, if it makes sense for them to even invest into that. But mostly the years, I cannot tell you a specific number because uh, every bank has a different SBA lending program. But I know at uh, one bank, like they wanted you to have at least like five years of experience in that industry, okay. right? But that's not to say there might be another bank that might do two or another bank might do 10. Wow. The fact that there's even the potential of two, I mean, that makes it incredibly accessible to mm -hmm. so many people who could become entrepreneurs. What do you think stops most people? Look, so <laughs> entrepreneurship is not easy. It could be really scary, right? Like everybody is addicted uh, to, you know, getting that biweekly paycheck, having that security. And you know, like, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, whenever you decide to take the leap and become an entrepreneur full time, it's a scary thing, right? But then the beautiful thing is like, you come, you keep consistent on what you're doing and hopefully you you know when to pivot if the, what you're doing doesn't make sense, but you could go on like trying different things. Eventually you're gonna be successful. But a lot of people are afraid of failure because uh, you know, you might have a family, you might have something else uh, that you have a lot of responsibility. So it's really tough to take that over. But what I do recommend, if you're looking to take the leap, don't have at least six months worth of savings. Everybody says six months, like you need at least a year or two because like, it could take you that long for your business to be successful. And if your bases are covered, 
you're probably going to continue, like, you know, uh, pursuing entrepreneurship because, you know, your bases are covered until you get to that point, like, oh, I'm about to run out of savings. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, at least at least I tried it. But uh, we live in America. Like, you can make so much money in this country. Like, people make money with a, almost anything. Like, there's somebody um, on TikTok, um, you're sleeping, and people watch them. They're making, like, $200, $500 a day. That's and that's a business. Like, mm -hmm. literally, that, that could be a business. He, he made an LLC for it. So... Uh, it's just a fear. That's what stops people. Like, and that and analysis paralysis. They just get stuck over analyzing things. The most successful entrepreneurs are way more successful than me. Uh, they be, they came from nothing. They had like nothing else to provide, and they just say like, I'm gonna I'm gonna become successful, whatever it takes. Like, you give them a piece of information, they act on uh, they act on it really quick, and they're able to know if that's gonna work out or not. And then that didn't work out. Let me go to the next thing because they have nothing else to lose. The action threshold is short and small. They just take actions again and again until one works. Mm -hmm. It's funny because so many people look at an entrepreneur that's had incredible success and think it came overnight or they just had an incredible ability to identify the right opportunity. But if you were to peel back the onion, so to speak, and look behind the curtain, there are a litany of mistakes and things that didn't work mm -hmm. out. I mean, most things I've done haven't worked out. Some yeah. have. Dude, I started maybe over like 14, 16 businesses in the last like 15 years. Wow. And like some were successful and they, they stopped working and until I finally found what I, not only that, something that works, because this is the other part of, of it too. Once you start making a lot of money, I know like this is going to sound like an oxymoron. I didn't understand it until like, uh, you know, I started uh, making a decent amount of money. So let's say you make like uh, 50 to $100,000 a month. At that price point, you can go to the best hotels in the world. Like, you know, I've been to the Burj Khalif, uh, the Burj Al Arab in Dubai, like Seven Star Hotel. And I'm not saying this to brag, right? Because, you know, I started making money, uh, come from poverty. And that's the first thing. Like, I want to experience luxury. I want to experience travel all over the world. Fancy cars, all of that stuff, the, the beautiful home, the best hotels. After you go through all of that, after a couple of years, then you're mad with, like, what am what am I doing in my life? I could get anything that I want with, the, with my money, so I, I no longer get the thrill, the chase of like, on one day I'm gonna own that Ferrari. Like now you have it, so you feel start feeling empty. And I went through that for a little bit, right? Like I, I don't own a Ferrari or anything like that, but uh, you, you do know. own a really nice car. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, um, eventually, I'm thinking like, what what am I doing in my life? Like I don't I don't feel motivated. So you have to find purpose. Once you find your purpose, like my purpose is like, I want to help as many entrepreneurs uh, be successful, whether to access to capital or saving money through taxes. And I have seen somebody I helped uh, like from starting from zero to all the way to becoming like a six figure uh, entrepreneur quitting their job. Like that gives me, uh, that makes me happy. So it gives me fulfillment. And now like, I don't really care about the money. Like if I make money, amazing. I, obviously, I have to make, keep making money because you know I'm a for-profit company. But um, having that satisfaction, that purpose, just keeps me motivated to keep going to the point that like I don't see myself retiring because retirement could be really boring. I agree. I, they say that you your life starts declining as soon as you retire. It's just mm -hmm. you don't really have anything to motivate you or to live for at that point. I, mm -hmm. I don't think I will either. And I, that's a similar similar kind of mindset with many entrepreneurs. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we talked about commercial lending, kind of what goes into that. Another thing I wanted to really cover is grants. I wanted to talk about the types of grants that are available, the the market in general, which how to find them, where to go to look for them, and how to apply for them successfully. So I'll tell you about like three different ways you can find grants. And by the way, like if you've seen this podcast, like uh, the best thing you could do as a new entrepreneur is just like try to try uh, grant stacking. Like uh, do as many applications as you can to find free money. This is money that you don't have to pay back. As long as you use the money for it, it it's intended purpose. And a lot of people, they don't want to put in the work of like going through the whole process of doing grant applications because it's almost like applying for jobs, right? And it sucks because like, you know, you're going to get the client after the client, but it's all a numbers game. Mm -hmm. The more you apply, eventually you're going to get some free money for your, for, uh, for your existing business or for your business idea. We just got to keep going. So it's about like two, uh, two or three different ways that I can tell you. Uh, I'm going to tell you the, the same ways that like uh, for-profit grant research companies utilize. And, you know, you want to start, start at the local level where there's less competition. If you go to, let's say, apply for like a FedEx grant, like a grant through Best Buy or something like that, that's going to be more popular. More people are going to know about, about it, right? So you start, you start at the local level. You're going to uh, Google this, right? You're going to Google SBDCs, a Small Business Development Centers in your county, right? These are institutions that get funding from the, from the SBA to uh, help provide free resources to entrepreneurs. 
And literally, it's over 67 uh, in the country right now. So at, at a minimum, one in, in every state. That the whole purpose is to help entrepreneurs get, get access to resources. Not just financing. You can even get a free mentor in your industry there. So you're going to Google them. Set up a consultation. That's completely free. It's a government-funded program. And then ask them, like, hey, like I'm a new entrepreneur. I'm an existing entrepreneur looking for uh, funding. I'm looking for grants specifically. Are you able to help me or guide me in the right direction? You'll be surprised how many local resources they have. Or th they might know any foundations that I might send you to. So, like, that's the first thing I would do, right? I literally just Google SBDC uh, near me, SBDC you know, in, in Orlando, New York, wherever you're located. And give them a call. And then see what, what, what programs they have that might be able to help you. And there's less competition with those, right? You also have... Um, this is a, li a little trick. You can call your local elected uh, official. You can go to openstates.org. And once you're, you're there, like call the person that got locally elected, like to cover the jur jurisdiction that you're in. Because those things are going to happen. Either A, if they know of, um, if there's any free money, uh, specifically to incentivize entrepreneurship in that area, they might know about the program. So you just give them a call. I'm one of your, uh, I'm, I'm a local business owner. I'm looking, I'm looking for grants. Do you have any resources or any grants that you know? Or can you help me guide me in the right direction? So that's one way. And if they, cannot, if they don't have anything, what you're going to do is the following. You're going to ask them, can you endorse my business? Can you do an endorsement as an actual local business owner so that, that can help me to uh, get grants? Now you take that endorsement, and when you're applying for the grants, I'm, elect, I'm, I'm being endorsed by this person. So that meets a criteria of grants sometimes, which is like social capital. And what looks better than a politician endorsing your business? So that's one way. But, you know, but again, it's a lot of work. You have to put in sweat equity to get free money, right? Uh, people just want to go and apply for a bank and get the client and keep it moving. Like uh, money that you have to pay back. And then uh, the, the, the other way, too, um, the SBA has grant, uh, grant programs. Obviously, they, they had a lot of grants in the last couple of years due, due to COVID, like a lot of pandemic relief. But you can check their website for whatever initiatives they have. And I think they have a, an initiative right now for uh, scientific-based businesses because, uh, you know, the country is focused on um, developing STEMs. So uh, they're giving out free money for that uh, right now. And, uh, I mean, those, those, those are just some tools that, that you can utilize to find grants. That's incredible. And so one thing that we were talking about off air is about the grants is how it's it's a lot easier to actually apply for them than you would expect or realize. What, where do you start? What are, what are some tools at your disposal to make it a little bit easier to apply for a lot of them? So, uh, you know, we're in 2023. Like uh, three years ago, um, it would have been like a little bit tough. You might have to fire like a grand writer if you're not a writer because like uh, I know I'm, I'm not the best writer, right? And now you can just leverage uh, artificial intelligence to get like 60, 70% of the work done. You could literally go to, uh, you know, openair.com, chat GPT, and enter a prompt, like write me a grant proposal for uh, a bakery business that's woman owned uh, and to be able to get fund, to, to be able to get approved for a grant. And again, it's more, you have to be specific, right? Be as specific as possible. You mention the county and even out of, of the prompt, uh, this grant specifically made up for women in business that are X and X and X. So like add as much as you can there in less than 60 seconds, like you're going to have six, like 60 to 70% of your uh, grant proposal done. And one thing is financial projections. They will even do the financial projections with you. So let's say, you know, one K might cost you $50 profit margins, like 60, 40, uh, be like, you know, write financial projections for me selling like a hundred cakes and have a, a a compa compound, well, this might be a little bit advanced. You might know about it. They compound it on your growth rate of like, I don't know, like four or five percent in, in, in that industry for the next three years. And then boom, now you have your financial projections compared to uh, paying like a CFA or somebody to do that for you. Wow. It's just that accessible. You just got to start. And you could do way more applying than you used to be able to do without those tools. Yeah. A lot of it, a lot of the bones of it will probably stay the same. It's, we talked about this off air, but it's similar to writing like a cover letter for a job or just editing your resume to be a little bit more customized to what you're looking to get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all you have to do is just get started. Yeah. That is, it's a numbers game. You just got to keep applying until you get that free money. What are some other common misconceptions about this whole world that people have and how do you kind of combat those and guide people through them? As far as like grants or loans? Let's go a little bit of both. Okay. So... It's going to sound a, a little bit uh, uh, hard to believe, but you can get funding while having bad credit. But now, what I like to say is like you can get funding while being like a, a, high, a highly qualified bad credit customer. 
So what do I mean by that? So there are institutions called Community Development Financial Institutions. The whole purpose, uh, they, they came out after the, uh, in the 1970s with the Community Reinvestment Act that that regulation said, I like, told the big banks, like, hey, like you're providing a lot of loans, uh, but then what about the small communities, like, you know, um, low income areas? Like, you guys love to approve the high, super highly qualified people, but what about like those people that don't have access to financial literacy, uh, underrepresented communities, right? Like women, uh, women in business, uh, you know, minorities, and uh, poverty reading areas, like you need to lend to them as well. So the big banks, instead of um, coming out, uh, changing the whole structure to add a, a program for that, they started donating that money to nonprofit institutions that the whole goal is to lend to uh, those people, underrepresented communities and people with a low mother income. Right, so now those institutions are willing to lend to you as long as your loan is gonna have an impact in the community. You have the ability to repay the loan, right? Like you leverage the five C's that we mentioned earlier. And then and for the character, if your credit, credit score is not the best, can you explain what happened? Like you just decided to buy a whole bunch of Gucci shirts and Gucci belts and you not didn't pay your credit card. That's a whole different story. But let's, say, let's imagine we went through a, a worldwide pandemic. You, uh, your business got shut down, you got furloughed, and then now you have a job and you're getting back on your feet, you're going through credit repair, you're trying to pay some of, the, of your creditors back, right, because you went through a hard time. You're actively trying to gain the education to, so you don't repeat that mistake. Now you have proven that, yes, like we're human, we can all go through a rough time, I know I have, right? And then now you have taken steps to change that. So your character shows like, I wanna pay these people back. I, I wanna make sure I'm not in this position ever again. So if you're able to explain that story and it actually has to make sense, then they, they will probably do the loan, especially if it has an impact depending on the purpose of the CDFI. So um, that's one way that you know people can get funding with bad credit. It, when you think that your credit sucks, you don't, you don't know about it. And there's over 1,600 CDFIs in the country, right? So like most of them government funded or sometimes uh, this, here's a fun one too for those, those of you who are like high income people. Um, compared to giving your go, uh, your money to the government, you can donate to a CDFI, and then if they have what is called a new market tax credit uh, that the government actually allocates a certain amount of tax credits to the CDFI to so provide to people that invest into the CDFI, and they get 39 cents on the dollar. So like uh, as a tax credit, dollar per dollar, not a write off. So instead of like you know uh, paying that, that that huge tax bill, you can donate that money and do, do some good. That's very cool. Yeah. And you can feel like you're reinvesting. Honestly, probably just build more companies in your local area and help your community do better. Yeah, 100%. What about on the, uh, so we talked about on the loaning side, what about on the grant side? What do you think are some other misconceptions people have? And the biggest mis misconception is that people don't, don't want to apply because they don't want to put in the work. And like, honestly, if I was starting all over brand new, I would just focus on getting as many grants as possible, right? Doing the work, doing the grant proposals, like financial projections, and keep finding that free money because that's money you don't have to pay back. And we all know how, how important capital is when you first start your business. Almost 80% of all businesses fail due to lack of capital. Right, so imagine having the accessibility to, to capital so your business can survive a hard time. And what better way to do it from the beginning when you don't know what you're doing? You just like figure out on the go, like uh, all, all, some of the most successful entrepreneurs have done. So you gotta, you gotta put in the work and you know, it's, it's all a numbers game. Keep applying, applying until you get that free money. I love that because you're so right when you're starting a new business, you, you, can, do, you can do more and accomplish more faster if you're able to take more swings because you're, you can afford to miss more times. The more times you can afford to miss, the quicker you're going to accomplish the goal, the quicker you're going to get the hits. So if you can access that capital for free for the intended purpose of starting a new business, why not do it? Exactly. But uh, you do have an advantage, though. If they're watching this podcast, they, they, now they're going to know they have to go and apply uh, as many times as possible until you get that funding. Because, yeah, you're going to get a lot of no's, but that's just that's just part of life. Like, you know, you get a whole bunch of no's until you get that yes. You, gotta, you just got to keep uh, going and applying. Now, one thing we haven't covered as much yet is taxes. I want to kind of focus on that a little bit. What are some things that you should be looking at as first steps as a business owner to make sure that you're kind of preparing yourself the right way with taxes? So, um, um, as this is one of my favorite topics, okay, so <laughs> uh, something that, I, uh, that always baffles me, right? When people go and they start making money, like, I don't know if you ever heard somebody say this, like, I don't want to make more money because I don't want to pay more taxes. Yeah. And instead, what you need to do is make that money 
and then get the education. There's a lot of free resources out there on YouTube, like uh, find a good CPA that, that's focused on helping you save on taxes, maybe a tax strategist. So you can figure out, like, you know, fix your money problems, right? But you're making more money, and then with that money, you can figure out the tax problem. You hire an expert that can help you, uh, you know, but some people don't even want to start a business because I'm going to pay more on taxes. But look, look like if you, that business becomes successful, you're going to have capital to figure out whatever problems co uh, come, come about later. So uh, that's, that's one thing that always baffles me, that people are like, I don't want to make more money because I'm going to pay more on taxes. What you need to do is get the education. Yeah, and you can, uh, I mean, education a lot of times is a write-off too. You can just pay for, invest. you can invest in continued education. I mean, my CPA writes off a certain portion of education I do. Um, I'm in my professional MBA program right now. That tuition is a write-off. There's all kinds of write-offs with education. And if you just keep reinvesting the money that you're making, it increases your earning potential too. You're increasing your earning potential while writing it off. It just, mm -hmm. it seems like, I'm just surprised more people don't take advantage of this, but I think it really is just an education issue. People just don't know about it. And the more people that hear about it, the more they can take advantage of it. Yeah, that, and then you start a, a podcast talking about taxes. Like, yeah, the right people are gonna listen to it, but like, people don't wanna talk about taxes, even though taxes are exciting. Why are they exciting? So, um, this is the main thing you need to know about tax savings. So. If you don't know if something's a write-off or not, right? Because like the letter of the law, uh, what the IRS says is not 100% final because it's one provision that they have that supersedes everything. And that is if you want to see something's a write-off, as long as like the, uh, the expense is ordinary and necessary for your industry, then most likely you can write it off as long as it's a legit expense. So, and sometimes the IRS might tell you you cannot do that, but you know, the tax code has a lot of gray areas. I'll give you an example. Um, so I don't know if you remember when uh, Trump started going viral with, for that $75,000 haircut, right? So uh, I cannot deduct that, I don't, I don't have hair, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, most people cannot deduct like personal grooming expenses. But on his industry, he's a public figure. And I'm just assuming, by the way, like what his like, tax strategist did, right? So he's a public figure, he needs to look the best of the best every single time. So he needs to have the best, haircuts or have, or have somebody that, that can maybe call him on the spot. So of course, like, you know, he's gonna find somebody for $75,000 and he's gonna be able to write it off because that's ordinary and necessary for that, for that, that specific industry. While like, uh, and you know, maybe that applies to content creators too, but the most important thing, you need somebody in your corner, a tax professional, that is gonna be able to defend you if you ever get audited, right? Because again, everything needs to make sense, it has to be documented because mm -hmm. you know the main thing that will save you from an audit, Documentation. Yeah, just documentation like this. Like make, it could be a book, it could be a Google Drive. Just like you document everything uh, on the audit. Like you keep a records of everything, like detailed records. Like it's gonna have, be a better time than you ever get audited, right? Whenever I talk to my CPA, it's all just why this, why this, why this, and he's like, okay, sounds good. Yep. And he's, documenting, that he's documenting everything because he has seven years. If something happens, he represented you that they could go back and has to like be able to show up for you. So, uh, the best accountants, the best strategies are like they keep like co co copious amounts of notes from the, from their people, the customers. What else do you think you need to know as a business owner? Just giving you know the best tax strategy. How do you identify a good CPA? So, okay, so it's a little bit of a difference, and I, I get this question all the time, and even when I'm uh, when I'm interviewing clients to see if I'm gonna take them, because I just don't take anybody, right? Um, I only wanna work with the people that, that I like to work with. So, I'm not a CPA, right? And then, yes, you should always have a CPA. I have CPAs on my team. Uh, a CPA's job, uh, nine times out of 10, they're a compliance base. Their whole job is to make sure that you don't get in trouble with the IRS. Versus when you bring a consultant, there are some CPAs that are consultants, they focus on tax strategy. Uh, they're working on finding you the best uh, write-offs tailored to your business based on your, the way that your business operates and even your personal life. Because every, again, everything has to make sense. So for you to find a good CPA, like that's, that's, that's fine. You just gotta find somebody that knows the industry that you're in, uh, especially you're making a lot of money, you wanna focus, You want to work with somebody that only works with real estate investors because they're, they're gonna know all the tricks. They're gonna know, and I, I don't like to say tricks or loopholes, it's literally the IRS tells you this is what you could do, but they're gonna be very familiar with the uh, tax situations that can help your business based on the industry that you're in. So at a minimum, deal with somebody that uh, focuses the type of entrepreneurship that you do. This is the benefit of being specialized or working with someone specialized in anything, I think, is they just, they have a very strong focus on 
knowing the stuff that you need to know and that you couldn't possibly know unless mm-hmm. you spent plenty of time researching it. A hundred percent. Like, it's, it's, and that's exactly what it is. So, you know, definitely have like a CPA. Uh, and it wouldn't make sense, let's say, well, after you have like $40,000, $60,000 tax bill, maybe find a tax strategy that, that's willing to help you. Yeah. CPA, so forty to sixty thousand dollar tax bill is around when you would start to look at that. I wouldn't. When it would probably make sense, like the fees that a tax strategist would, would charge, like at that point, because like you know who wouldn't pay like ten thousand dollars to save a hundred grand legally? Exactly. You know, like I, well, I'll pay that every day of the week. Now, completely switching gears here. Another thing, uh, the way that I found you actually was through your content on yeah. Instagram, and that's something we talked about a little bit. Talk a little bit about your journey as a content creator and how that's supplemented your business. 100%. So I, I'm an introvert, right? Like uh, in real life, and even though my social media, like I'm actually show, uh, showing up as my authentic self, um, I just never, before I started getting into content, I maybe I would do like one post every four years. Like I hated social media. Mm-hmm. But you take a look at uh, some of the biggest brands in the world right now, let's say in cosmetics, you look at the uh, Kylie Jenner, whatever her name is. Uh, when she long, Because she had attention, which is like, in my opinion, number one form of currency, she was able to capitalize on that and build a multi-billion dollar company before she was steady. You know how much money like a, a big corporation would have to spend to like have a launch like that, like the, like the one she did? And all she had was people was people's attention. So that's when I started putting two and two together. I had to build a personal brand because you never know who's watching. You never know who I'm going to be helping to make sure like that people know me and my business. So in 2019, I went on a trip. A uh, client invited me to uh, go to a mastermind. And I'm like, what is a mastermind? So I go to that mastermind uh, so I could go up all the way uh, halfway across the world in, in uh, Indonesia. And fun fact, I hate flying. That was the longest flight I've ever been. 14-hour flight. Uh, thankfully, uh, you know, I, I put it on a credit card, but I was able to get into business class uh, just because, like, I wanted to be as relaxed as possible because I was literally freaking out the week before, thinking, like, wait, 14-hour fly? Like, no, like, I'm, I'm probably going to die. So, <laughs> um, you know, we make it there, and I'm, I meet all these young entrepreneurs that were all content creators. And then, you know, we start talking about finances, and I'm like, wait, like, how much you guys are making? It's like, there's no way. So I eventually I take one of them as a client. I saw how much money they were making. And all they were doing was just like posting content consistently, talking about what they do and who they help. And I was like, wait a minute, like, I don't like being on camera for, for the right amount of money I get on camera, right? So mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I started following what, what they were doing and I started learning about direct response marketing. And it's the best thing I, ha- I have ever done, you know, like just being able to like leverage my brand to help other people and promote market my businesses, sometimes for free. Now, you've been at the content game for a little while now, at least a few years we had talked about this. Yeah. I think it could be helpful for anyone who is maybe considering this beginning a content journey to hear about some of the hurdles and some of the the milestones along that journey. What have been some of the big hurdles that you've faced that have kind of held you back or caused difficulty along the way? And what have been some of the big milestones and accomplishments? Uh, I would say uh, it's hard to keep going, which uh, as much work as one piece of content can take, especially when you get it started. Like if you guys see my content, one video, that might have been like 20 retakes. And eventually you start getting better once you get on the rhythm of things, but um, you have to keep going because it is impossible, and let me repeat this, it is impossible to, f- to fail if you remain consistent in what you're doing. Eventually you, something's gonna hit, right? So that's one thing, you have to remain consistent. And it sucks a lot at the beginning when you just put in like, you know, you take two to four hours to make a post and then you get 10 views and it's your mother looking at the post and commenting. Yeah. That was my mom at the beginning. <laughs> she doesn't speak English and she would just post hearts, like stuff, every <laughs> single post. To so this day, you can see my mom commenting on all my posts because I told her like that helps me and she don't even know what I'm saying. Just hearts and she's uh, usually my first like. So it sucks when, you know, nobody's really engaging with your content, but all it takes is just one post to go do really good, right? Once you have that post that starts doing really good, now your whole act, 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 attitudes change, right? That I uh, combine, um, for example, I have the same, was, I forgot who I learned it from. Like success is when preparation meets opportunity. So you have to be prepared, like whatever it is that you're selling, like have it on the back end to be able to provide that service and offer it to people, whatever that looks like on your side. And the opportunity is like having that one post that goes viral, right? And the main thing that you have to do is don't be afraid to provide value, like really talk about what you do and then every time you're posting something think about this my ideal person my ideal customer my avatar how are they going to get value on the other side 
if I was my customer and I see this post, is this something I would actually want to save, share, like, and engage with it before? Because a lot of people just like to talk to talk, but you have to provide value. Provide a um, massive amount of value for free, and eventually, like, things are going to take off, right? Like, they're going to take off. Like, for example, like, recently, um, I've been uh, creating content for the last four years. I have been super inconsistent. I go three months posting, great, make money. Um, or, you know, maybe I don't, I don't make money. So I'm just providing value for free. Like, why am I doing this? But Because uh, I have, like, real businesses to run. But then the moment I started being super consistent, like, my content just went to the, to the next level. Like, I had a post would go viral. And it's funny because it wasn't a highly edited post. It was just simply I was getting out of the gym. I didn't look the best, no haircut. Uh, and oh, sure, I was sweaty. It was like, you know what? I made a commitment. I had to post every single day for the next, like, three to six months, no matter what happens. So I'm doing my post. Less than 30 seconds, um, you can even see it on my face. I'm just, I look bored. Like, I'm like, but I have to do this because I have to be consistent. When, like, when my, my competition, they don't start, so why, why am I going to stop? So I post it on a Friday night. Next morning, I wake up and it has like over a thousand likes. Next thing you know, like, you started going viral. Like, it had a quarter of a million views. And then uh, that actually brought my business close to, uh, over, close to 6,000 leads. And it's still going to this day, no ads or anything. Right. And, you know, like I, we're able to uh, get, gain some clients from that. But before that, like I really didn't want to keep posting. But, you know, and honestly, why I was doing it, because I know that somebody's going to get value on the other side, even if it's just my mom. And she don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, that was my main goal. So mm -hmm. I heard Alex Hormozzi say one time that when he was first getting started with content, he had that similar struggle as just a couple people maybe engaging with it at first. But he would imagine say a content piece is getting three, 400 views and that's all you can crack. He would imagine that that content is going to a room full of three or 400 people. Exactly. Because it technically is. It's exactly. That many people are seeing it, even if they're not engaging with it, you're getting that many swings. And so eventually something's going to take off. A hundred percent. That's the same thing I was thinking too. Funny enough, I don't know if I saw that video for him or somebody else, but uh, imagine like right now for your business, you got a hundred people to listen to what you have to offer. That's a hundred views. Right, like, but you don't have to worry about like uh, paying for a stage, uh, paying for a conference room, marketing dollars to get the hundred people there, and they're just hoping that they actually show up. And you can just do it for free from your phone, and start talking about the whatever gift or whatever service you're providing to the world. So just like that, like a hundred a hundred people in a room, like that will be an amazing turnout for that event. Yeah, I think it's just so important to keep your eye on the ball in that way. Now, another thing I want to talk about, because I, I told you I'm in the world of exit planning and a major thing I've noticed just talking to you, you have your hands in a few different things. You're doing a lot and you have team members behind you that are helping you with things. I want to talk about a little bit of the back end. How have you been able to build out a team and what's gone into that? What are the lessons that you've learned building out a team? So I have hired like, a, a, you know, stay side. Uh, employees, uh, that's usually super expensive for somebody getting started because, you, uh, you know, you have to pay all these taxes, you have to pay a payroll, payroll. Uh, you already have a, an upcoming expense when you don't even know you're making the, uh, money next month. And it's really hard to uh, run a business when you're getting started that way. So you can leverage virtual assistants in uh, different parts of the world that they, for them, like I'll, I'll give an example, like I think the minimum average uh, rate for a day worth of work in the Philippines is $5 a day. Uh, and now you pay, you could pay that employee that four to $10 a, a, for an hour. That changes their whole life. And there's a lot of talent overseas in the Philippines, in Colombia, in my country, Dominican Republic, that are willing to do a little bit uh, cheaper labor than in the United States, right? And then um, I love to leverage them to remove myself from what I call uh, um, minimum wage activities. Uh, so I could really focus on the big picture for my business. And I don't mind doing what, you know, customer service, everything that I have to do. But, you know, as your business starts growing, you cannot do everything at the same time. So you have to create systems and processes to be able to uh, to make sure that the house doesn't really fall. And then, you know, I have le I leverage BAs uh, to be able to help me a lot. Like I have some great BAs right now. What are some examples of things that you've outsourced to VAs that have worked out the best for you? Uh, customer service inquiries, uh, sometimes even like social media management, responding to uh, uh, messages from customers, uh, doing uh, simple processes like, uh, you know, sending surveys, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff like that. It helps me graphic design sometimes, right? Uh, for me to hire like one of the best, like a really nice graphic design company for a, a startup, it might be like a couple thousand dollars for uh, brand guidelines, right? Like that, I could yeah, I could get that way cheaper for like three hundred dollars overseas, and it might not be the best work right away, but you'd be surprised. You can find a, a lot of good talent. So, mm -hmm. 
the company that I exited earlier this year, I love telling this and I think it's relevant, was built off of a $13 Fiverr logo. Thirteen dollar oh, wow. logo, mm-hmm. and people love the logo. It was just, it was so simple, but thirteen bucks on Fiverr, it's incredible. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, I, I just don't, I don't know how to make a logo. I don't have experience yeah. in graphic design. I would n- never know what I'm doing, but someone did. And that's it. Like, you just have to got, have the resources because, you know, it's not all about the logo, the business, and all that stuff matters. What matters is like, are you actually able to uh, make money with what you're offering? Because your customer, when they're looking at you, like, they know you're not Pepsi. They're like, I don't like that logo. I'm not doing business with him. It's like, what can you offer? And what's their, your reputation in the industry? And that's what's going to help you. But uh, and, and with the BAs, with the virtual assistants, like, nobody should feel bad about providing an affordable living in a different country that's uh, cheaper than that's helping you compared to what you should be paying in the United States. When you have big corporations, like, just call any other big companies, come because customer service. It's going to be in a third world country. Mm-hmm. Right, it's gonna be in a different country because they have access to a cheap labor. Right, uh, funny enough, like that when I first uh, found out about banking, I used to work for a call center overseas, uh, for Wells Fargo, PNC, Bank of America, and a couple other banks in the customer service department. Right, so um, <laughs> the big corporations do it. Why can't us, like small entrepreneurs, that really need uh, the help with the cash flow? What is it? What What is the quality that you think you have that's allowed you to continually find and hone in on these bigger opportunities? I've noticed a trend of right there. You said you used to work at a call center, and that's how you learned about banking. What What is the quality that allowed you to say, "Oh, that's the next thing I'm going for"? Like that is that is my next biggest point of leverage. For me, uh, I like to analyze things to see like what can uh, make me money, right? So that's one thing. But the main thing is like uh, I'm an immigrant, right? Like I came to this country legally uh, at 15, and I left all my family back home, right? Like my mother, my sister, like everybody, right? And I was able to come here because I knew that this was a land of opportunity. Even though you see a lot of people complain about America, but like this is one of the best countries in the world. You can come as a foreigner and start a business, start making money, even sometimes when I speak in the language, right? So like literally this is the land of opportunity. But for me, I know that I left uh, because yeah, my country is full of nepotism. It's not an amazing country, but um, unfortunately, like it's really tough to make it. Uh, if you don't have the connections, you're not connected with the government. Uh, it's really tough for a business because you don't have access to capital like like here. So it's really you have to bootstrap a business to make it successful. Not to say that you can make a lot. I have a lot of friends over there, entrepreneurs that are really doing amazing over there, right? But I had to let go of that to make something out of myself. I had to leave my own country and I have people depending on me back home. So I had to grind as hard as possible because. I'm not only am I tra- trading, you know, my time for money, my sweat equity and all that stuff, but I'm also trading valuable time with my family because uh, I came to this country to work, so I cannot waste one second of it. That's why I'm always on the go. How can I make more money? How can I uh, help more people so I could, like, help my pe- my family back home? Because I'm neglected over uh, close to 20 years of so spending time with my mother and my family just be, uh, by being here, you know? So uh, that's why I'm relentless. What is your favorite part of the DR? Uh, I went there for the first time earlier yeah. this year, actually. You know, man, like it's just like that. That's that's home. You know, like you, yeah, you have the touristic areas, but it's a country full of people that that are happy, uh, people that are hardworking. Like I remember, I was just there uh, back in April for uh, spring break, and I've been all over the world, like uh, twenty plus countries, and I was on this four wheeler, and I got stuck on the uh, on the beach. Like some random people came to help us, like to get the uh, the four wheeler stuck. Like, and I've been in other countries where I have some instances where I need help, and people just keep driving by. Like my people just go and, and, and help you. And then that, and we have some amazing beaches all over the country, right? Like uh, the amazing coast. Beaches like, are amazing. Yeah, yeah that, that, the food is amazing. I mean, I, I, I really love my country. And then if I could be born again, I would be born over there again, you know? So. Do you get to go back often? Or? Yeah, I go very often, uh, at least like three to four times a year. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. What are some of the biggest mindset shifts that you've had over the years that have helped you think bigger? For me, um, you have to get rid of your ego problem. A lot of people have tend to have an ego, an ego that I had even when I went to the mastermind overseas. I'm looking at all these young entrepreneurs, no qualifications. Uh, and I say no qualifications, you know, I, I have a college degree and all that other stuff, and I work my uh, ass off, so you can beat that uh, part out, like to get to where I was, uh, to get promoted within, within the bank, like literally first in, uh, last out. And just always doing the extra, so I could so I could really perform and get promoted. And then I have uh, then I met all these guys that they were just like uh, hustling, you know, entrepreneurs like trying to figure out. And I thought it was better than them. And you know, and, and little the ego the, was telling you, 
I worked for this. I should be making more. Like my career should be further. I should be able to put in this much and get out way more than them. Yeah, like I come in, like I'm, a, I'm a BP. Like there was a guy, like also like full of tattoos. So I'm like nothing wrong with that. But I'm, I'm like, now nah, in my mind, I'm better than all these people. But like you know, all of those guys were humble. They were just hungry. They kept going, and I, and I, I started noticing, like, wait a minute, like I'm actually learning a lot from these guys. I cannot judge a, a, a book by its cover, but I was already preconditioned to think like. You know, you go to school, get a college degree, and then uh, you you work for the man, like for corporate, and that's how you make it uh, in, in life. When realistically, that's what they tell you. But there's there are better ways that are a little bit riskier. And uh, even for example, you go to school, and again, like I'm I'm college educated, went to Temple University, uh, but you go to school, you're really being taught how to be an employee, to take like uh, to answer specific problems and questions, like so you're being mentally conditioned your whole time. Eventually, when you're an entrepreneur, you're on the go. You just have to figure out, like, you don't know what's going to happen next. So you're, like, on the unknown. You have to think outside of the box. Uh, college and uh, school teaches you to to not do that. So that's why it's really hard to transition from being uh, an employee to become an entrepreneur because that's how you, you have known all your life since kindergarten. So once you're able to realize that, that you have been mentally conditioned, and mind you, not everybody should be an entrepreneur, by the way, but if that's something you want to do, definitely pursue it. But once you realize that you have been mentally conditioned, like, okay, like I need to escape this mindset and then really work to what's actually works for my goals. So what I'm hearing, it sounds like, is defeating that, that mental conditioning for you was just a lot of exposure to uh, mm-hmm. what was possible, just being around those types of people, seeing being- that they could do it. Being, Why not being, me? being in their room. And once you see like somebody else, like, wait, they may have much. I don't know I could make that. That, but like the biggest thing as an entrepreneur, you need to let go of that ego. Like, and that this is coming from somebody that had a huge ego. I thought was better than everybody else. And quickly did I realize, especially I like, going full time entrepreneurship, uh, you know, you have sometimes you're doing amazing and sometimes that you're doing really bad. And you need to be able to go and ask for help. Before, like, I, no, I just I, I thought I was like a, that guy, but realistically, I wasn't, but I was willing to learn. And so like, getting rid of that ego, uh, you know, it was, was a huge thing for me. Why do you think most people don't get to that point? Because it could be a little embarrassing. Like imagine you're uh, on your, your teddies and then you have a successful entrepreneur in the early 20s. Like, for example, I, have, uh, I paid a lot of money to, uh, to consult with a social media company that it's like young kids, like 22, 21, 23, but like they way wealthy, wealthier than me because they're focused on that all then. So... For some people, like, oh, like, let me talk to this uh, almost teenager. Can you help me out when I'm a, I'm a grown man? Like, not a lot of people can do that, but uh, I'm able to do that because I know they have the knowledge and they know exactly what they're doing. So, you again, you just have to get rid of that ego and just, like, humble yourself and, like, ask for help. Do whatever it takes at the beginning. Like, the first couple of years, they're going to suck. Like, uh, I know Hormozzi call it, calls it the uh, Isha stage where you just, like, do whatever you need to do to be able to survive. And you're willing to do that and keep going, and one day everything's going to pay off. But it sucks at the beginning. I like to call it the uh, time in the desert. Yeah. I am kind of coming out of a period of time like that where I had exited a business, started a totally new one, and spent a lot of time figuring out how to make it work and, and kind of getting out of that now. And I, I like to just call it my time in the desert, just searching for the answers. Mm-hmm. It, you just have to spend some of that time searching for the answers, trying things, figuring out what works out. Exactly. And again, you don't you don't give up. Like you keep going. One day you're going to be successful as, as long as like what you're doing makes sense. Do you set goals as a business owner? Yeah, I set goals, uh, but I also try not to really fall in the goals because before I was heavy on that. And I will have this issue. So um, have you ever heard about neutral thinking? I haven't, no. Okay, so uh, there's this guy, I forgot his name. Like He has an amazing book I wish I could remember. Uh, he's the coach of uh, Russell Wilson. So, you know, quarterbacks have like milliseconds Pete to make. Pete Carroll. Uh, no, 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 sorry. Oh, he's a quarterback he, coach? He's, no, he's a mindset coach. Okay. Yeah. So they have milliseconds to make a decision. So imagine you're doing positive, positive thinking the whole time. I'm going to throw this touchdown. Uh, every single time they're going to make it. If they don't make it, it does something to your brain that when you start thinking, like, I just fail, now you get down, and then those thoughts can start creeping in, and you're already starting the next down. So the, with the power of neutral thinking, you're just like, I'm going to throw this ball. I'm going to do the best, uh, and that's all I know to do. I'm just going to do my best. So you, you make it amazing. You make the, the, the touchdown, but you just got to keep going. It's just you perform at the moment. You can't really get caught in the moment. Like, you throw it, they, they miss it. And or you, or you, 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 uh, they miss the pass, like you just gotta keep going. Like you just gotta focus on the next play. So that's kind of how I run my businesses. So before I used to set large goals, 
and let's say you know the, um the the one time I thought I was going to make like uh like close to $60,000 on one day and I probably made like uh $8,000 like what an event that I was throwing and I f I felt terrible but then at the same time like that's still a really good amount of money to make in a day but I thought like oh this is how much I'm going to make and I started getting disappointed to the point that I you know getting like a little bit depressed like I'm not meeting my goal I'm beating myself up but realistically with the power of inertial thinking I'm going to go in I'm going to provide value. I'm going to help this, uh, my future customers. And whoever wants to work with me, they're going to work with me. And then now I don't have to go through that disappointment or even the uh, euphoric excitement. I just stay, I, I know I'm going to perform to the best of my ability. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure like I, I cover my bases and then whatever happens after that happens. It reminds me, um, I've observed this in test taking, just in schooling, the people that do well on tests versus the people that don't, I think just get caught up in the result they, they're thinking about oh I, I i don't know if i'm going to get the result that i'm looking for on this test the people that do really well on tests come in and just say i've done the preparation that i've done i know how much i've done and i'm going to use that preparation and mm -hmm. the result just comes exactly because like you, the mind is a, it's a it's a powerful thing like you let a uh, negative thought start creeping in then like it, they could literally overtake overtake everything and even influence your success so you have to like you know definitely read that book i just forgot the, the name of it uh just look google neutral thinking uh russell wilson mindset coach and it's an amazing book and I actually met him in person at, at a conference like that book will change your life if you start practicing that what is your definition of success and how has that changed over the years? So uh, success, uh, you know, before I thought it was just making a lot of money, right? Like uh, being able to have the freedom of mobility by not having to work a, a nine to five. But look, I'll take a nine to five for, if I ever need to uh, nowadays, right? So, uh, but now like just being able to show up every day, do what I want, uh, help my family out and then provide a lot of value and, and to the entrepreneurs that I work with making sure I'm aware delivering because like when I help somebody save money on taxes, that's extra cash flow added to the business. I can help them grow. Um, and, or when I'm helping somebody get a loan, like I'll tell you a story. There was a guy that uh, came up to me, obviously I'm not gonna share his name or anything like that. And um, in the trucking industry for quite a long time, that's all he's known his whole life, his insurance laps. So in that industry, you're basically out of business. The new insurance company told him he needed like around $120,000 worth of funds in the next like two to three weeks. Guy had amazing credit, go to the big banks, gets declined, and essentially he gets referred to one of my companies. So, and funny enough, like I'm actually helping him myself directly. He was Dominican, so I'm like, let, let, let me try to help this guy, right? So we were able to get him the funding in less than two weeks, and that funding just, you know, this guy's crying. Like, he's like, look, like, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was gonna be out of business. This is all I know what to do. I have a family. Uh, I thought it was impossible, but then you helped me get access to this capital. Now I continue, I continue, I'm gonna continue like, you know, making over a million dollars a year with this business and when nobody else could help me. So like those, those type of moments uh, is what really makes me feel good. You know, compared to like, oh, anybody, okay, here's a long grade, but like I was able to ch make a difference in that guy's life, right? Like that he could continue like doing what he does every day. I love that. What have we not talked about that you would love to talk about? Uh, I think we cover a lot of things, man. Uh, we definitely did. did on the mindset, a little bit of marketing, taxes, and commercial loans. Um, I mean, all I'm gonna all I'm gonna say is like entrepreneurship is a beautiful thing. Uh, you know, it gives you gives you that freedom of mobility. However, I don't follow what all the gurus said online, which I don't consider myself a guru. I'm just somebody that actually walks the talk. Like I have real businesses that it, this is what I do every day, and I just talk about it online, right? Uh, to see who, who I can help by just providing free, free value. But before you think about quitting your job because you you might feel inspired from watching that, this podcast or another podcast, make sure your, doc, your docs are in a row, right? Like entrepreneurship is amazing, but then, you know, you still have to cover your insurance. Uh, small things like them being able to qualify for a, a, a regular mortgage. It's a lot of things that people tend to oversight. So make sure, you know, it, before you go, you already own a home that you own. So you don't have to worry about that like two to five years later. For, for for when you will potentially be able to qualify, uh, unless you do a statement loan, that's another conversation. Uh, make sure you have enough cash reserves at least a year uh, before you you uh, you you take that to make sure your bases are covered, so you can actually focus on what you're doing. And uh, you know, by all means, like take that risk at least once in your life, so you're not gonna have a regret at the end of the, at the end of your life where you say like, I should have started that bakery, I should have started that that uh, plumbing company, I should have taken the risk. 
uh, you don't want to sit on your deathbed thinking like the, the what if compared to like I tried everything that I wanted to try and then what I worked I worked out and I'm I, I lived a fulfill, fulfilling life. I love that. Anything else that you would want to say to the audience? Um, I, th I, th I think that, that that would be everything. Uh, you know, uh, well the other thing is like if everybody uh, is lendable and any anybody and I and I'm gonna repeat this anybody can get uh, access to funding for the company, but it's not a matter of when. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, right? Like once you have the knowledge, you know exactly uh, what, what what to look for and you know you understand the five C's of credit, that what the banks are looking for, you can understand what the requirements are and start working to make sure you, you fit their credit box. And don't stop, like keep going until you find that find that, uh, that person that's willing to fund to you because you know ca capital is uh, essential for, for new businesses. This has been an incredibly insightful conversation. You've certainly changed the way I think about money a lot, mm -hmm. honestly. The way I think about the accessibility of it, the way you use it. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me, man. Absolutely. Awesome. And that's a podcast.